All yep. right. And we are now officially live for uh, yet another episode of Dark Bites Horror in Review. And of course, as always, I am your host, Rick Hipson. But most importantly, I am here today with uh, none other than Aaron Dries, all the way from Australia. Um, so Aaron, thank you so much for being here. I know it's uh, the wee hours of the morning for you and nobody in the right mind in Australia is probably awake. It's definitely not chatting to people from Canada. <laughs> Look, I can't think of anyone else I would rather be talking to at 3 a.m. in the morning were it, <laughs> were it not the mirror and me thinking about my, my life choices. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Well, you know, they say nothing good happens at 3 a.m. So we'll, uh, we'll see if that holds true for this. So Look, the the, ben the benefit is that I can I can have a nice little drink as I sit here and chat to you, and then as soon as we're done, I close the laptop and I just merge to the to to the bed right here to, to my left, <laughs> and, and and all is all it all comes out okay in the end. Perfect, I appreciate it. Well, I know I've got my coffee. It's uh, eleven o'clock in the morning here, but uh, yeah, coffee. Thank you for having me. I'm. I'm Really, really humbled and, and appreciated massively. Awesome. Well, the, the pleasure is all mine as well. Um, and it's so cool, too, to chat with you again. I know uh, the first time when I, I first met you, uh, such as the power of virtual conversations, uh, was about a year ago, I want to say, on uh, it was a virtual convention, I believe, the CoronaCon. <laughs> with, um, I, I know there's a few folks in there that I'm totally going to forget. I know, of course, our, our friend Brian Keane was a part of that. Uh, yep. Uh, Wiley Young, and I probably shouldn't even remember, say mention anybody else's name except for yours because I know I'm forgetting a few people here. Maybe you could help me out. Um, but of course, you're one of them. I was one of them, and Wiley was definitely there. I can guarantee you that. <laughs> yes, yes, and I think um, our, our friend uh, Mr. Southard was there as well. I believe West West Southard. I think Wiz was there. I remember having a bit of a bit of a chat with him as well. Good people all around. Have you had them on the podcast yet, or, or what uh, do you think? Not yet. No. Speaking of uh, a bit ago, before I hit the record button here, I know we were chatting about not having enough stuff. Um, I did pick up, so I thought, well, limited time here. Let's see. I'm going to pick out two people, and I know uh, one of the ones that I, I picked out. Um, not to uh, no discredit for the other guests, uh, but the other one was as well was Wild E. I, I, how do you say Wild E without wanting to say Coyote? Uh, I while E. Yon, I picked up his uh, Magpie Coffin. Um, checked that one out. Great, great book because mostly yeah. I picked that one up again. No discredit to anybody else, but I thought Western Splatter Punk. I have never read a, a you know that type of a genre. I just thought that sounded interesting. Uh, yeah. Everybody hyped him up, and I thought, you know what, with a name like that, uh, he's either really good or he's really gimmicky. Let's find out which it was. And it turns out he's really good. <laughs> really good. So, really, really good. That that book also has an incredible front cover. Like the cover mm -hmm. on that book is just gorgeous. Anyone who says if you don't, anyone who says you don't judge a book by cover, look, we shouldn't, but we all do. It does matter. It matters so much. Absolutely. Yeah. And it, and it was very good. And I'm so excited for that one too, that he's got a, I think he, I saw on his social media that he just wrote the end at the end of it um, a day or two ago for the sequel. So I'm, yeah, I can't imagine how he's going to up the ante on that one. I'm, I'm looking forward to it though. Yeah. It's going to be great. He, he's a terrific guy, terrific guy uh, and kind as yeah. well. That's one of the yeah. great things about, you know, being a writer is, is having the opportunity to meet people that from all over the world. Uh, I've met these guys, I've hung out with them. Uh, and they are as charming and as talented as you would ever hope to be, but also they're just friendly and, and are willing to have a laugh and to help you find your way back to your room in a labyrinthian <laughs> hotel in the middle of some obscure <laughs> U.S. state. Because uh, that's, that's usually how it ends in these conventions. In the middle of <laughs> exactly, especially when you start Good having people. a few... Uh... A few a few drinks at three a.m. <laughs> uh, look, I, I I wouldn't have any idea what that's like at all, at all. Of course not. Of course not. No, uh, no, clean clean cut all the way. No, very, I'm very very clean cut. Just ask anyone. <laughs> <laughs> of course, it's that's um. The look, I, really comes oh well, that's 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 right. But I I I can't wait until the world re realigns into some sort of degree of normality so that I can get back overseas and hit the convention circuit again. It's yeah. wonderful here in Australia, but really there is nothing quite like it in terms of 
stuff that I'm genuinely interested in as a fan, as going to the convention circuit in the US. It's, it, and, uh, it's, it's terrific. If you get a chance, Rick, you've got to do it. It's really, really great. Definitely. And, you know, I'm one of those few people that I, 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 I gotta admit, I don't really travel a whole heck of a lot and stuff. I wish yeah. I did. Um, I really need to get my passport because there's so much going on. And as I meet more awesome people like yourself to everybody saying, you got to go to this convention, that convention. And I'm like, I know I need to get like a, you know, a compass or something like that and, and kind of do like a, a three hour radius around me and, and kind of put a pin on the map of all the places. Go to. There's, there's so many close to me. I know well, we're going to get everyone to we're going to get everyone to to Canada. We're going to get everyone to Toronto, right? <laughs> Absolutely for Fan Expo and I know yeah. uh, uh we're more give them a plug so they're not as closely tied in with the Fan Expo anymore. They I think they do their separate one now festival oh, okay. there, but they're still doing that. I think they're doing that out in Vancouver City as well and uh, Gotcha. But yeah, Toronto's only about an hour north of of me and I'm I'm in Kitchener. You know, for those that have never heard of it, that's not going to change their minds, probably. Don't forget about it. But yeah, Toronto is pretty close to me. So I look, I lived in I lived in Canada for about a year and a half oh, um, uh, in Vancouver. Oh, OK. Um, I, I got to I got to Toronto, but um, I stayed in. <laughs> where was it? Hamilton? No, okay. Hamilton? I, I know Hamilton? Hamilton very well. I've got lots of family there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, I was there with friends um, when yeah. I came over to visit and I stayed with friends um, uh, in Toronto. But I, yeah, I lived in Vancouver for about a year and a half. I was backpacking around the world and I ran out of money. And uh, Australia and Canada have like a reciprocal kind of visa arrangement for people under a certain age. I okay. was that age at that time. And I rocked up destitute <laughs> on the shore <laughs> and was willing to, to work in whatever I could find and managed to scrounge up over a year and a half enough money to get myself out of Canada. But it was a bittersweet nice. farewell and I miss it terribly. I have terrific friends in Canada. I can't wait to get back. I really right. can't. Yeah, and I know um, with Australia too, um, again, you know, one of the things we talked about very briefly is one of the few sports I follow because it's easy to follow is MMA. And yeah. I've been listening to that, um, especially with the athletes. Some of them are reconsidering locating here completely because mm. while your your government over there doesn't mess around with so many different things, which I, I, I love it, it's go big or go home kind of thing. Things are extremely locked down over there, I understand still. And yeah, Which... it's it's very touch and go. Like it just as soon as you think that we're going to be seeing some sort of like easing restrictions, the situation just kind of changes again. Um, look, I've I've spoken to some friends internationally, and I think the perception about what's going on in terms of just how COVID is treated here is it's not as bad as it as it perhaps seems to be from the outside perspective, but. I, I happen to live in a in a city that is in a in a bit of a geographical bubble. Yeah, I'm in Canberra, which is the capital of Australia. It's a little bit like Washington DC, only with yeah. it's in the middle of the bush. So it's kind of surrounded by all of this geography that kind of barricades you off. You know, like the the wall in in um, <laughs> Game of Thrones style. Only yeah. no snow. <laughs> uh, it, <laughs> And so there's just a geo geographical thing that's been actually fortuitous for us in terms of being able to kind of self-isolate an entire city, um, yes. kind of Stephen King under the dome type type thing going that's on. That's what I was thinking, yeah. Yeah. Um, it, well, look, no one's, no one's murdered each other completely, you know, to that degree, <laughs> but it, there's still plenty of time for it to all go pear-shaped. Exactly. Yeah, give, <laughs> give it time. There, there's still hope. Well, that, <laughs> there's I, story this, fodder. The thing, the thing that I love about Under the Dome, well, I, I really like that book. I think, it's, have you read it? I have not, no. no. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a good book and I like it more than most people do, but I know that originally Stephen King had intended to, he was going to start writing it in like the 1970s, but he was like, this, bit, this book is too big for me. I, I'm not ready yet as an author I, and he shelved it. And originally it was going to be called The Cannibals, which kind of shows where he was hoping it would go. Yeah. Under the Dome doesn't go that far in the end. Um, everyone manages is 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 so kind of twisted into into distress that they turn on each other and destroy their little mini utopia before they even get a chance to eat one another. Which is it, <laughs> maybe save that for the sequel. <laughs> it's yeah, a silver it's, lining, I guess. Yeah, swings and roundabouts. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but we Everybody digress. Everyone's insane, but nobody gets eaten, so it's you know. 
you win some, you lose some. <laughs> yeah, the, every every cloud has a silver lining. You're exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> Hilarious. And I know um, what what I found really interesting as well, getting back to kind of um, how we met and why I, I kind of, one of the reasons I picked you out of the crowd is, is, as well, which, you know, maybe sounds creepy and it, it probably is, but. Um, it it could be the, more creepy. You could be, you could be at my window right now. It could get so much worse. <laughs> crap. Okay. I'm going to have to find a bigger bush. Bigger bush. <laughs> Upgrade that bush. Yeah, it's all about the bush, the bush. <laughs> uh, so one of the cool things that I liked that jumped out at me was not only are you, you know, very easygoing guy, you know, very easily likable. Um, is that you also had an interesting background I find too. And, and that you were, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think you're still doing this somewhat as, as your day job, um, is that you've got a background as well in uh, youth addiction counseling, and you've also worked in uh, long-term care. You've actually got a story set there. Um, I know we briefly talked about this a little bit on yeah. socials and whatnot. Uh, I currently work in a um, in an LT, sorry, long-term uh, long care center, for those that are wondering what the acronym is all about. Uh, so that obviously jumped out at me, and I really enjoyed the fact that you've got this, you know, psychological background. And mm. of course, going back to the gimmicky thing too, I thought, okay, your Aaron Dries, who's got a book called House of Size, I'm like, that just flows too darn well. So I'm thinking, <laughs> did you come up with that title because you needed a gimmick or are you just that good? And of course it turns out you're just that bloody good. And I'm gonna reach behind me for a second here too. Sorry if I fall off my chair um speaking of uh don't judge in books by the covers this is such a gorgeous book as well so i uh, hope that shows up okay i absolutely love the cover of that book it's a great cover um the first one i read i think it was just because the order they showed up and of course was was the fallen boys um so that i thought awesome. was absolutely brilliant i mean the way that um you really dive or dove into, you know, the psychology of this lonely, uh, broken child, for a better way of putting it. Um, mm. The intriguing part about that is he came from a pretty mundane family, normal family. Uh, by all accounts, he had a good upbringing, but this poor child was absolutely broken. And of course, the tragedy that happens without giving anything away is that those closest to him, particularly his his parents, his dad, uh, get absolutely drawn into this well of darkness with this with this poor boy. And I thought it was absolutely brilliant the way that you outlined all of that. And of course, it did make me think back to your background. And it made me curious too, as far as you know, again, your background as a youth addiction yeah. counselor. Um, you know, how much do you find that your your background plays into those horrific roles that you enjoy playing in and, and creating for for us well so yes current current day job and it, it fluctuates between like certain different disciplines but uh, youth youth work um i'm currently working specifically in homelessness in the homelessness sector uh have in the past worked in aged care specific services advocacy um, and mental health, uh, for, generally for people who struggle to get government funded support. So for people who kind of fall within a whole of uh, a service hole, but for, for lack of a better word, um, but currently working in homelessness. And I guess, um, you know what this is like, uh, working with people. It can take, yeah. it, it is, um, people often will, you'll say what it is that you do and they'll go, gosh, that must be rewarding. And <laughs> you know what, look, yeah, it is. But what I really want you to say is, gosh, that must be really hard <laughs> because exactly. that's, because that's the truth of it. Um, there's not a day where I sit there and I put my feet up and I go, I've done a rewarding day work. I go, I put my feet up and I go, I ache everywhere and I'm so emotionally drained and I'm, I'm just churning with these emotions that I, I need to process in some sort of healthy way. And I literally lift up my laptop and my self care regime is to just kind of sweat all the toxins of of the day literally onto the page um so but it's not just about putting the bad stuff down it's a it's about for lack of a better word and i'm not being overly dramatic i kind of uh by day i see the best and the worst in people and 
that universe is incredibly chaotic and it's often merciless. And I think writing for me is taking all of my complicated feelings about everything that I do between the hours of nine to five and trying to put it into something that I can rationalize and make sense of. Uh, it's uh, and and to try to make it beautiful and to to into some degree kind of have some continuity. And although my stuff is really really bleak, I think it's bleak with a silver lining that there's little glimmers of hope there. Hopefully, um, and and I think it's in becoming intrinsically tied to my day job. It really really is. Um, my recent one, Dirty Heads, definitely kind of taps into that. And I've got a collection of short stories coming out next year which is called Cut to Care, which is a collection of stor short stories that is all built around the, the cost of caring, about caring about something too much, about somebody caring about you too much, about not caring enough, um, and about they're all psychological horror stories built around that theme. And they're essentially kind of cries from the front line. They're the stories of nurses and, and emergency workers and social workers and the people that they work with um, and so that to me has been a massive purge over the last two years during COVID when the, the commitment that it took to write a novel just wasn't something that I could muster really uh, because the, the, the world went to, into hell in a handbasket to some degree yeah. and uh, I'm extraordinarily grateful that I've been, managed to remain employed through that time but I've never been busier so for me I couldn't I needed to get those those toxins and that kind of piecing the universe back together in a, in a healthy way. I needed to be able to do it in a manner that kind of worked for me in terms of my time frame, which is why short fiction became my go-to over the last year and a half. And I'm really, really, really happy with this short story collection. And it's coming out next year, but it's exactly what you're talking about. You're right. It definitely plays in. And it kind of always has. And for as long as I continue to work in this industry, which I always will because I love it, as much as it doesn't love you back, um, <laughs> it, it'll continue to be so. It's really part of my self-care routine. Perfect. Do you, do you have a self-care routine? You know, kind of working working in, in, in your line of work, it, it has great, great perks, but it can be rough. It can be. No, I do have the benefit as well that I am, I'm actually a housekeeper. Yeah. Um, so I've got the, probably the easiest job in the whole building. However, when I first started, so I've been there just a couple of years now. Um, so I work in more of a, more of, I guess, the open space generic area on um, part of our, our LTC. There's also a, um, major research institution attached to it as well as a, um, they call it the living classroom. So as well as a, yeah. a school where the nurses and PSWs are trained. So I mostly take care of all that area. But for the, about the first year that I started, I worked uh, just an incredible experience, really, is I worked in our only um, secured area. So all of our uh, residential areas, um, so sections are all called neighborhoods. Yeah. And it's set up so very much those look like a village. We've got a corner store and, you know, and, and a spa yeah. and all the rest of it. It's a really cool setup. So I'm in the, or I did start off in the only uh, fully secured area. So they were for folks that had... Um, uh, advanced dementia that uh, the big uh, qualifying ticket if you will is they they have to be exit seeking and yeah. when I first started there I'm not going to lie when I first got there I thought what the heck am I in for it here because <laughs> yeah a lot of the a lot of the residents there were not verbal um, mm. some of them were quite vocal with various in various aspects um, some of them would attach themselves to you and yeah you basically had a shadow the entire shift but then I found out that these are the people I really miss because unfortunately mm. when you work in long-term care, the inevitable is that they are eventually going to pass away. So that's the best part yeah. of the job was getting these connections with these people that the littlest things as much as helping somebody out or having a quick conversation with them, uh, yeah. help them open a can of a bottle of Coke uh, makes yeah. them so happy. And, um, some of them are, are, are lucid enough that you're able to actually have a conversation a little bit about, you know, their, their life and where they're from and that. And then of course you also in talking to some of the other uh, team members and that, that have their full, you know, portfolio on them and, and find yeah. out what some of their backgrounds are like, it's just amazing. Yeah. Um, 
you know, incredible stories, it's stories that you is. hear as well. You know, it's, uh, the, the, there's a book in everyone and some have yeah. multiple volumes and it's, and it's a privilege to work with people so intimately. It really is. Yeah. And it's just incredible. And I mean, they're obviously there at their, it doesn't get more vulnerable than that. And it's, uh, yeah, just incredible. Um, I remember we did a little, um, a training seminar and it was very poignant and very sobering as far as the reality of what, not just what we're facing, but what the people that were there to care for are facing. And this is just mm. their day-to-day life is that we wrote on a piece of paper, all of our favorite things, the things that make us most happy, um, family members that we love the most, that sort of thing. And then we pulled them up into a piece of paper and uh, we had our instructor go around and took things from us. We had no idea what the OR, but obviously the point of it is you don't get a choice in the matter. And they could take things like, oh, uh, so that's your child. Guess what? You have no idea who your child is anymore. Well, you love to write. We're going to take that. Guess what? You don't even know what writing is anymore. And kind of on and on it goes to the point where you're maybe left with one or two things and that's it. And it was like, but, but these are the most important things to me. These are my life. And meanwhile, realize and so at the time where I was working, I thought these are people that don't have a choice. It's just gone. And, you know, the trauma they go through and the, the confusion. Um, and then there's the occasion of one that's an absolute bliss. You know, they yeah. look out their window and they see the most amazing things that, of course, are only there yeah. for them. But it's, uh, yeah. you know, unfortunately, I think it was like one out of about 60 people. <laughs> well, that's right. And look, I, there are times when I go to myself, I, I, working in this line of work does two things it makes you obviously appreciate everything that you have and if you if you're lucky enough and privileged enough to be able to enjoy a conversation like we're having then gosh aren't we blessed and then on the on the other hand you feel like you're swimming with sharks whereas i would have rather have not known there were sharks there waiting (laughs) for me and they're kind of haunting me everywhere i go because i know what's coming if i'm lucky enough so to speak to get there um, and I don't know what's better to never know that the sharks are down there or to, to live with them, knowing that eventually the shark gets us all in the end. And I don't have an answer for that, but I know that trying to reconcile that anxiety is some of the stuff that toxins that I get down on the page. It absolutely is. Definitely. And I've been really finding that as well. And I've been finding, I guess, so my self-care too, to go back to your question for me to turn the table. Um, a lot of it is, is reading and, and my own writing as well. Yeah. Um, I think I kind of mentioned to you as well about various time constraints. Now I love having these podcast conversations because it just, it's so much more flowing. It, it actually get to talk to you as, as a person, you know, face to face virtually. Um, but one of the things that I also do try to find more time for is that self-care, which I, I, I definitely get out of writing my own stories. Uh, I know in the beginning of the pandemic when nobody knew what was going on and so much, you'd walk into work, sneeze, and they'd send you home for 14 days. That's right. Um, that happened to me. And I thought, well, what the heck am I supposed to do? And, and that, I mean, sure, I've got at the time, uh, you know, a one-year-old to, to contend with and everything else, but let's face it, they've got toys and they're, they're, they've got mummy and they're pretty happy. So what about the other uh, various hours of the day? So I ended up writing a short novel and I also Brilliant. got a chance to work on some other, um, other short stories and things. And I find like yourself, it's just such a great magical way of just getting all that in on page. And it, uh, it makes you, it makes you, it, uh, if, if only I, it, for me, writing is a little bit like going to the gym. And if I went to the gym the way that I write, I'd be buff and fit as. I'd look like <laughs> the rock. But it's, it's like the mental gym that for me, yeah. I don't need to do a great amount of it. I just need to do it with the regularity and to have the routine that I crave going back to it each day. Yeah. And, um, and that is, became more and more apparent during the pandemic because I needed architecture because of the uncertainty that everything else was thrown into. And so having that muscle built up and ready, I kind of felt as though I had someone on my side the whole time, just this little quiet little writer (laughs) dude on my shoulder. Who's like, it's all right. (laughs) You'll get there. We've we've got, we've got a thousand words later on tonight and we, and you just get through this and that's the carrot on the stick you need to get through. And yeah, yeah, I'm so happy that you managed to put words on the page 
not everyone does and that's something to be strongly commended well done thank you now it's just about getting to it and finishing the editing process which of course is where the the real story kind of gets gets shaped and takes place and hell yeah writing is editing i i adore editing my, my work i hate editing other people's <laughs> work i'm not a good yeah. editor of other people's work but i'm a very good editor of my own um to to the degree that it is required then you do and should always give it to somebody else but um i, I love editing for me writing is rewriting um that's how i work that's it's why it takes me so long yeah i i find yeah. the same thing too it's it's such a long process uh yeah i personally don't have nearly the um the resume that you do or the experience of of the writing world that you do and successful experience of the writing world so i, I tend to write my first drafts quite messy and um oh, my I'm first excited. drafts my first drafts are messy too i i'm like pound out as much as i can on the weekends yeah. or when i have that time and then spend the time that i know i need to make to to edit uh and, and to refine so it, nice. it's um i remember and, and i am really bad that whenever i start writing i need to reread everything that i've written which is <laughs> just kind of a ridiculously obsessive compulsive kind of like time consuming recycling but i i remember watching i was watching the making of magnolia uh the film from like 1999 and yeah. um and uh, Paul Thomas Anderson described that method of writing as, as what he does. And he described it as ironing a sheet that he's got this huge big sheet that he needs to get through uh, and he'll iron this one little bit, but before he goes further, he'll go back and loop back over and gradually kind of this, this, this cycle. And I'm like, that's exactly how I work when it comes to my fiction too, which is why I've been writing professionally for like 12 years now. And like, I don't have like this gigantic portfolio. It's, probably why <laughs> <laughs> true but it's the quality stuff i mean obviously Thanks, it's man. you nailed it i mean i've i've only read uh three work yeah three works of yours so far uh you know the fallen boys uh house of size by aaron dries and uh <laughs> sorry you have to and then no one heads. pointed that out to me i wish somebody had pointed that out to me because <laughs> i swear i swear to god that I never made that connection whatsoever. <laughs> That's hilarious. Well, and the um, uh, the, the novella that you put to at the end of uh, uh, the House of Size, the uh, the prequel to it, um, and I'm brain farting on the name right now. I could probably look it up, but you know what? The sound of his bones breaking. Thank you. I was going to read that one, but I know I had a TBR pile, and it was taken absolutely forever maybe this was a precursor to the uh the worldwide shortage of uh, lumber and paper that we're going through right now but it <laughs> took absolutely forever to get um uh to get that uh the book sent in to me so i thought you know what i'm gonna hold off from reading this right now because i don't want this enjoyment to end i want to have something to look forward to as well just in case um i i don't get the other book ever i don't know uh yeah. and I've, i had i think i had another book on my deck too that i had to read for review so i thought okay Nobody's expecting me to review this one. I really want to enjoy this. I don't want to kind of, you know, blow my load all at once here. So I'll come back to this later on and, and, and enjoy it. So, um, which I'm kind of glad I did because now I can still look forward to that. And of course, yeah, I totally. through uh, Dirty Heads. But I'll, I want to talk to you about Dirty Heads in a little bit. But the first thing, sure. um, if you don't mind, that really intrigued me is you're talking about the, the self-care and the writing and getting everything in on the page with, I think it's phenomenal. And I think that's commendable as well, because, uh, you know, it's like working, digging ditches all day, then you come home and you want to go out and you want to start, you know, pumping the iron and lifting weights. Uh, that's kind of the exertion part too. And I imagine that it takes you a little bit of a transitional period to push through and maybe psych yourself up a little bit, but as you're writing and you're writing the words that is your self care and you're no doubt utilizing some of the wicked traumas that you're hearing about day in and day out, because these are the people that you're, you're helping, which is, is incredible in itself that that is a really rewarding experience. And I'm so glad that, that yeah. you are doing it as much work as you put into it. That's, that's the heroic stuff. Um, but as you're doing that, Aaron, do you find that uh, you've gotten some unexpected insights maybe into your own psyche as a result of this, or maybe some some insight into the psyche of some of the people that you're helping out, where you maybe had some aha moments, whether it's understanding or 
hey, I have a better idea of maybe how to direct this person or how to direct your, yourself through your own self-care or, or, or otherwise uh, therapeutic approaches? That's a really interesting question. I think the things that I've learned through working in this particular industry is that I, like anyone else, am, love to think that I have the resiliency to never be affected by it, but do have that vulnerability. I think that if I didn't and wasn't at risk at it, I wouldn't be well suited to it. That's what, that's what empathy is. Um, the, one of the great boundaries that you need to learn to adapt your, your thinking to is to be able to empathize with people, but not to sympathize because that is right. the slippery slope to really um, doing yourself in because you start to see yourself continuously in those that you uh, are helping uh, what I do is I cut that off and that's where the writing aspect of it kind of, that's where I get to sympathize with people. I think the thing that I've learned is that I am susceptible to vicarious trauma, that it is something that's not just this theoretical thing that they warn you about. It is something that absolutely does happen. And if you don't address it, it is like, uh, it is like acid chewing through your day, your, your, and, and your body and your home life. So I think that's something that I've absolutely learned. Um, I've definitely looked and worked with people who I can see myself in. And that is often uh, quite rattling. Uh, people who you realize if I had made one or two decisions different in my life, that I could be the one in, in need of desperate assistance. Yeah. Um, but also there are moments where you do see people where, and I'm just, uh, I'm very grateful for the privileges that have been awarded to me, which include, for example, not, not inheriting a, a, an addiction in, in vitro, you know what I mean? Or not having right. acquired brain injuries uh, or addictions that were formed or, or trauma that was inherited before I was even born um, or, or in my early, early development. So I think it's, it's, it, I definitely have really, really strong boundaries, but humanity does slip through like we're kind of a slippery species like that. Yeah. Um, but I think that it is that vulnerability that makes you well suited to the role. Um, so I guess those are the things that I've seen and learned about myself. Uh, but however, I do need to allow myself to feel sad about things sometimes or to be excited about what I learn from people out on the field. There, there will be people who I meet who have insights about the universe that I've never thought of before. Mm -hmm. And it comes from hitting rock bottom in certain circumstances in ways that I haven't fortunately had to in my life. And, uh, and whilst I've never kind of taken someone's story, I've certainly tapped back into the way they've made me feel when it comes to my fiction. I genuinely have. Um, and often that comes around to the having to look for hope in the utter darkness of despair. And it's there somewhere. You just may only see the shape of hope. It might be right. just a, but it also might be somebody in the corner waiting for you. Like that's, <laughs> that's the, the end, but that's where the, the horror element kind of kicks in, I guess, to some degree too. Absolutely. Definitely. I guess where the, the what if it's like, well, what if I get out of here alive, but then what if I don't? So it's, it's a, it's, it's a very precarious balance. <laughs> That's why that's why endings are very important to me <laughs> with 100%. with my works uh, yes. because uh, because yes I'll leave it at that <laughs> absolutely and I know um, and I noticed that as well with the um, you know at least the three books that I've read of yours as well is that the endings are very much a part of the story where it very much seems that whether it's intentional or not, everything seems to lead up to that ending and everything feeds that ending. And in a sense, the ending actually feeds the story that came before it. Um, there's so often that you can tell that somebody just didn't know how to end a story. Mm. And they're like, well, my story's finished. So, um, and then the world blew up or, and then they smell yeah. the world off at the sunset. But yours don't quite do that, especially I know with the, with the Fallen Boys, like that one, mm. uh, I've read a lot of novels over my life, and I'm not just saying this because you're here. I've actually got um, <laughs> a couple of girls in the laundry room where I work at absolutely hooked on your stuff. And uh, they all the felt the same way. They all felt the same way that I did as well, especially with the Fallen Boys. Like, man, that one just absolutely sticks with you. And I mean, 
Well, I, thank you. Thank you for having a little that. child too. It everything just it's exemplified as well, and I I I, I felt the trauma. I, I really, really appreciate you saying that. And also, you know what you were saying before about the things that you learn from the people that you meet and work with? Well, I feel as though from what you said just then, I just I, I literally feel as though I just learned something about myself and my writing process that I've never really been conscious of until you said it just then, which is that everything feeds towards the ending. And once you get to the ending, you realize that everything is fed towards the beginning. I've never really realized that. That's actually very, very true. Um, I may not know the moment that I start off a book exactly how I want it to end, but I know exactly before I start writing how I want the reader to feel by the ending. And so for me, emotional continuity uh, in, in that respect is extraordinarily important to me because I know that you only have one, they say you've only got one opportunity to make a first impression. Right. You've only got one opportunity to end a book right. And for me, uh, it's not a game. I, I'm in the. I'm not in the game to mess that up, um, because I know what it feels like to be a reader. I, I write because I read, and I know that there are sometimes where I'll close something. I'm like, I wish that that had hit another button, um, and that may not detract from the overall experience, but it, to me, it's something that is massively important. Um, so thank you for saying those kind words. I really genuinely feel as though. I hadn't realized that that's what I do because there's not anything that I've ever written in which I don't feel as though the ending has been built reverse engineered from the first line. I just, yeah, thank you. That's actually really, really great of you to say, because it also helps because I'm currently working on projects at the moment and I'm like, wow, but that's what I'm doing already. I get it. That thank you. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. I'm glad I could, I could bring that insight. Yeah. Um, and it, it's something I've, that I really got drilled down into me when I was, especially when I, to move on and talk about uh, Dirty Heads, which I've been really excited to talk to you about as well, is that I found that through the ending, um, I mean, it's, uh, I'll lead up to my point in a second here, but I, I did find that the way it was written was just, was incredible. It's very abstract. Uh, there's a lot of, things that you left up for interpretations that mm. could be certainly construed one way or the next. Uh, I mean, it's quite frankly, the format of the book should have been really awkward, but it wasn't because you essentially started out what felt to me like kind of like a street journal where the main character, yeah. uh, Heath Spooner, you're right in his head. He's talking about things as they're happening. He's running from this unseen entity that's right on his heels, like the, you know, hell hounds and you're not really sure what the connection is there, but there's clearly some kind of, he's got some kind of intimate knowledge of this thing. You don't know why or how it generated. And then when he gets sort of a, to the destination he's going to at that particular moment in the opening of the book, it's almost very cinematic where all of a sudden it's like, yeah, this camera that kind of pans out and you get more of an overhead view of his life. And the majority of the book is told through a flashback, which mm -hmm. for me personally doesn't usually work, but it works so well in this because all of a sudden you're still getting into his head but now you're all skinned into the heads of the people that are, you know, in his circle between his friends, his bullies, his family, his, the people that he kind of bumps around with sort of thing in, in his life. And then, and to, to my point, um, once you actually reach that, that conclusion, uh, it's left, you could certainly say it's ambiguous, but at the same time, because it does leave certain things still up to interpretation mm. where you know, you kind of wonder the true monsters of the book. So I'm like, okay, so is the monster part of this kid? Is it a separate thing? Is it, and I'm not going to, I know this isn't a spoiler because it's part no. of the synopsis on the back totally. of the book Totally. where it's like, okay, is the boy, did he create this monster? And then I really got thinking about it. I'm like, holy crap, is, am I the monster? Is, is the monster mm. me and, and the rest of us that are kind of witness to all the things that happen? And then it really made me want to go back again and kind of loop back around it and read the book to, <laughs> Now that I've got an understanding, I can sort of, there's some different colors that are going on here that maybe that I, I didn't, I didn't have that in my palette. Now I do because of that yeah. fantastic um, ending. Was that always kind of your point where you left things ambiguous mm. enough and up to interpretation? So you got that readability? Re -readability? Yeah, absolutely. And the, the, the older I get, the more important to me ambiguity is not to say that I don't love a conclusive ending as much as anyone else and won't sure. continue to write endings in which you know 
this is a certain feeling that I want you to, to, to have. For, for me, in terms of the thematic kind of architecture of Dirty Heads, it is a book about the anxieties surrounding uncertainty. It is a literal, because it's essentially a coming of age novel in which we all know what that feels like. It is the, it is literally every day is diving off the, you know, the, the high board into a pool <laughs> where you cannot see how yeah. shallow or deep it's going to be or what's in those waters. And so for me, the thematic kind of um, pin that I was resting every kind of plot mechanism and in terms of intended effect on the reader was, it was all stemming from ambiguity. Um, now, I kind of do want my cake and yet I want to eat it too, because whilst I love ambiguity and I was definitely working with that, I didn't want a reader to be unsatisfied. Um, and I think that the structure in terms of it's starting off in the present and ending in the present, but the, the whole middle chunk um, being a flashback is that again, it's that reverse engineering that right. it's a kind of a palindrome that the answers are mostly there. And if they're not there, it's because uh, no, it, it is that, it is that Lovecraftian, <laughs> the unfathomable you know what i mean which yeah. is the which is the joy of writing something that's slightly got cosmic underpinnings because essentially it's the story but for me that's okay in a story like this because uh all right i'll i'll quote i'll, I'll paraphrase terribly clive barker <laughs> i will okay. terribly no one can <laughs> unless you are unless you are directly quoting clive barker you are doing a terrible job of paraphrasing it because he's so beautiful and eloquent. Yes. The, uh, Dirty, Dirty Heads is, is specifically about um, a, a young kid's coming to terms with a young kid coming to terms with his sexuality. Yeah. Uh, and, and he, he probably later in life will identify as being gay. Clive Barker wrote a really terrific book called Sacrament um, in which he basically said that, you know, look, the universe just keeps on trying to fuck up, you know, gay guy, gay people, you know what I mean? Uh, they, yeah. they, they'll throw a plague at them. They'll throw prejudice. They'll throw insecurities. They'll throw, uh, the universe will throw everything they can to kill homosexuality. And yet, like magic, it keeps coming back and surviving. And there is no reason for it to do so because everywhere, every day, kids are springing up in defiance of this cosmic fuck you. Yes. <laughs> and, and, and for me, there is no answer there other than uh, some sort of beautiful mystery that is intrinsically tied to at least my identity as a human being. And so I kind of want to play in that ball pit when it comes to Dirty Head specifically. Um, because the whole thing with Dirty Heads is that it's the story of a kid not coming out to his friends. Like, I love those stories, I, I, you know, but I didn't want to write about that. I wanted to write about a child, and this is exactly how it was for me coming yeah. out to myself, which was that I had no idea. Everyone was like, oh, we always knew. I'm like, oh, you, <laughs> you could have told me. You could have, you could have given me a bit of a heads up because I had no idea until somebody gave me something in my real in, in reality which is exactly what's in the book yeah. um and and i self-reflected and i went oh my gosh <laughs> it all um, makes sense bro, bro, the it all makes and... it all makes sense and, and the moment that you that it does make sense uh it, it that it should be something that's beautiful because if they say it gets better and it does for most people yeah. but at the time what happens is your entire universe turns on you and it feels as though some cosmic entity from outer space has just launched a grenade in your life that will absolutely destroy everything that you thought you knew about yourself and the way everyone saw you. And that is exactly what Dirty Heads is about. It's about the way that coming out to yourself for a certain period of your life until you either come to terms with it or die from it is a type of murder. It's a type of it's a type of illness that, that uh, cancers away all the things that will either kill you later in life, being prejudices and people who want to do you harm, or things that will mutate into the strongest and most resilient parts of your life into the future. 
And so Dirty Heads, although whilst it's a short little novella, encompasses that emotional journey. So, and there's no reason to explain why and where it comes from because Heath Spooner, like myself, have no idea, or Clive Barker, have any idea where it comes from, but it's happening every day. And so that's why ambiguity is, is, was part of the theme. For me, all things serve the theme uh, in regards to every metaphor that you have, every allegory that you make, it all needs to suit and fit and go in the flow of the theme. Otherwise it needs to be cut. So I think in a really roundabout kind of esoteric way, I think that addresses the question, but at the same time, <laughs> it's it's appropriate that my answer should be ambiguous. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, I think um, the ambiguous aspect of it works so well because, and as you were as you were given the very eloquent uh, response to that, which I think is is hundred percent. Like I'm, uh, if I had pom poms, they'd be going up in the air right now. Um, I don't look good with pom poms, and I don't have any. But if I did, <laughs> this is the benef- This is the benefit of a visual medium as well as like a podcast. You can have the pom poms. I know I should have like a green screen behind me and like yeah, <laughs> um, go team ambiguity. Uh, <laughs> but the the funny or the well the interesting part about that really is, as you're talking about that and about the whole role base, you're trying to trying to fuck you just for your, I guess difference if if you will. Yeah, is that, yeah. I mean, the one question, I'm sure you've heard this so many times before, and it probably pisses you off even more so even than me. I think it should piss everybody off is that, you know, there's now, thank goodness, like a national acceptance uh, regarding, you know, parades and, and, and pride parades and things like that. People are like, well, yeah. why isn't there a straight parade? I'm like, well, because nobody's trying to freaking put you up on a cross and persecute you for being straight that's the difference. You know, the same thing of the whole Black Lives Matter. Why isn't there White Lives Matter? Well, obviously your life matters, but who's trying to put you on a cross and persecute you because of your privilege? Correct. Um, so that kind of stuff just pisses me off to no end. Um, but I think at the same time, it's um, it's almost like people are trying to normalize what or what they think is normalized and they don't understand it. And I don't think they realize that's like, well, don't make me your normal. My normal is my life kind of thing. And I think that's a big thing that's going on in the world right now where it's like everybody, and I, and I suppose maybe it's something that a once upon a time served us well, you know, when we were cavemen mm. living in the caves and we didn't understand something and we should probably get rid of it or be rid of it otherwise because that's something, maybe it'll kill you. Maybe it's a snake and you've never seen one before. So that part in your brain thinks, act ah, different. I don't understand it. Let's destroy it or let's get it out of our circle kind of thing. But, you know, we're not caving. We don't live in caves anymore. We've, we've got the internet. We could, you know, we're pretty good at understanding what's, uh, what really is in da- what we're really in danger of. And it's, it certainly shouldn't be each other. And it's certainly not indifference and things that go on in somebody else's ideology, unless, of course, they're acting that out in violent, dangerous ways. And, I mean, I, I don't think people are exactly going, going around with sticks and saying, well, I'm going to beat you until you're gay like me. You know, that's mm. just not happening. Whereas the other way around, unfortunately, is, oh, what do you mean? You're gay, unlike me, so I'm going to beat you with a stick, whether it's proverbial or, or real. And I think that um, in a lot of ways, that's what I love about the, you know, the ambiguity of, of the book, Dirty Heads, is it really makes you, at least for me, it made me think who the monster is. And a lot of it, I think that's a lot, I, that should hopefully be taken as self-reflection. And I really hope, like myself, um, I don't think I'm any major scholar guy where I can interpret the words and they come up with all kinds of wonderful, uh, you know, scholastic sounding interpretations of every little sentence and stuff. I'm not that guy, but hopefully other people will will really reflect on that too and wonder like I did who the monster is and hopefully come to the conclusion where, and maybe I'm wrong. I don't know if that was your interpretation, Aaron, Mm -hmm. but I came away realizing that the monster is me and, and it's, it's everybody. And it's, how do you change that? And it's, in a sense where Heath has to come to grips with mm. that and either embrace it or keep on running from it. Yeah. And, and look, it, it, I would love to, 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 I'll say this much because I'm cautious of spoilers for people who may be listening, but I think that it's esoteric enough as a concept for us to, to discuss. Um, those monsters exist within Heath also. 
Um, and, and I think that the thing that I wanted to do with this particular book is that there is a clear distinction in the book between the monsters that come from just being raised a certain way, but being raised in a loving environment versus w- real true evil. And I won't say what that is in the book, but it's right. there all the way through. And I think uh, feedback I've gotten from people is that they didn't see certain revelations coming on that first read, uh, but did on a second read. I'm like, well, good, because that's exactly how you should feel because those, uh, that wasn't, that's not just an evil, it's a deceit. And there was nothing deceitful about Heath being raised in a heteronormative environment about the fact that he he's in a, a room that was painted blue and that his sister was in a room that was painted pink and that he goes to a Catholic school <laughs> where, where the issue with homosexuality isn't that somebody may or may not be gay, but that somebody would call somebody gay because that is the offense. Um, right. All of the, uh, uh, that a bully who is, an obvious asshole is kind of you know almost ant farmish type of way programmed and and needs to be to have that role all of these things are natural and so there's no real villainy there and yet there is villainy in this book kind of in on the corners of every page and when you realize what it is it makes the monster seem tame because right. yeah so so these are these are all some of the parallels that are running at the same time and i think that's tapping into what you're saying and and the whole idea of the ending for those who get that far uh is that it's all about it's all about anxiety it's about it's about somebody who literally lives with the fear of the unknown and who wishes that at some point in the future the rest of the world would know exactly how he felt if only for a day and 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 I won't say more than that. <laughs> yeah, but it's all there. It's all there. And I love the fact the fact too that you you do have all these monsters and you've got all this you know some pretty evil stuff going on and of course the tension with the anxiety and very humanizing traits and things that be picked up throughout the book through Heath's coming of age journey. Yeah. But then at the I don't know if I'd say at the core, but certainly part of the core of that. And there, there's so many layers in this thing. It's, it's like uh, an onion, um, you know, but it's more. Um, more I, I like a lot, a lot easier on the, yeah, a lot, a lot easier on the palate. Um, <laughs> is that you've got this real kind of a sweetness in there as well, is that despite the anxiety, the fear that he has, he also has this really strong desire to protect the people closest to him that are being, you know, I guess, in, I don't know, infected or yeah. affected by this monster as well. And I was wondering where that maybe came from. That was just something from, you know, your own inner core, your, your own mm-hmm. as a human being, or for some, you've also recognized too, and maybe a lot of the, um, I mean, I hate to say damage, but I guess in a sense, I guess yeah. in a way we're all damaged to a point, but the people you help out with, if you kind of get yeah. that from the background too. I th- you know what it is? I, 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 I can summarize it in a word and I think it's love. It's, yeah. it, it's, it's a, it's a, a inherent, uh, I won't speak about myself, but I can speak about the character. Um, he is not a perfect person. He's inelegant and doesn't do the right things. And when it comes to choices, he probably makes the wrong one at every turn. But the one thing he never didn't do was love his family. Um, and there is probably a thousand and one things that his mother could have done differently but one of those things that she did perfectly was love him. Uh, and his, even though she was really tough on him, you know, and, and then he identified that that was her thing. Her thing was <laughs> to be tough on him all the time. Um, and his relationship with his sister, uh, I really wanted that to be something that was tender at its core once you peel back that onion layer of sibling rivalry that's always there. They're, they're, yeah, they're my, dynamic. yeah, my favorite moments in the book. There's two favorite moments in the book, and it's to do with the siblings and how they they are working through what's happening to their family, 
and one of which is basically a conversation where he so desperately wants to confide in his younger sister. I remember that. Walking <laughs> so home from school. Yeah. Walking home from school and she's really young and he doesn't need to say it. She already knows. Yeah. And then she doesn't need to say it, but she kind of does say it later on. But she says it in a way that to me is such a child's way of, of, of exhibiting and voicing yeah. what he's worried about, which was, a boy's allowed to have best friends and she says it at a moment that shouldn't be there. Like it, it's not the time or place, but it's exactly the time and place that's yeah. that a child of that age would ask that because kids ask the most beautiful and weird and confronting things on their own schedules. Yes. And it doesn't matter if the world's about to end, <laughs> they want to know. And yeah. even if they already know the answer to the question to, to you know, so I love that relationship and I think that it's really, really, um, and this is the power of hindsight, if I'm looking at myself in terms of my own journey, is that it's really, really easy to look back and to just go to be that angsty teen with my copy of Girl Interrupted and Prozac Nation under my, under my belt <laughs> and, 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 to be, uh, and to be like kind of giving everyone the finger and to dye my hair black, all this shit that I did, you know what I mean? Yeah. And go, fuck you, you know what I mean? But really, that was just another way of me not, you know, addressing the monster, because, uh, because because love is sometimes inconvenient when all you want to do is allow yourself to 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 indulge in hatred, self hatred, so that you can get through it and become something else. Love can be inconvenient, um, especially when it's the love of of a sibling or a parent. Um, so I, I'm with, I wanted to acknowledge that even when people are going through hell, sometimes if you're lucky enough, there's love being shown to you that you don't see until you're much, much older. And I hope that Heath, wherever he is now, remembers those conversations that he had with his sister because that shit was real for, for her. Yeah. That's, uh, well, that's beautifully put. And I, I think you might have partially answered my next question. I might just have a couple more questions uh, yeah. before we, we wrap it up and let you uh, roll, roll back in, into bed. <laughs> so <you can> <laughs> I'm, having my, I'm having my second wind like that. <laughs> yeah, I, I can't believe it. This is, this is awesome. So it's so fantastic here. So I was, I was worried that I was going to turn you into a zombie for a little while here. So all good. Um, again, much appreciated of, of your, of your time. Thanks for no traveling worries. across the world. <laughs> Um, so the one question then, so, and again, you, you really touched on a lot of this, so it might be more just maybe an embellishment of what you've already said, Eric. Um, so what would you say then? So if, if you've got somebody else, and, and maybe you know exactly what you're going to say, because you've said it before to other kids and, and people that have gone through this before, but is so anybody out there that, that's watching, uh, you know, listening to our conversation right now that maybe is going through some of their own monsters, uh, be it their own sexuality, be it their own other, uh, maybe alternative identity, or <clears throat> just struggling to, maybe they're on the spectrum and they're just trying to struggle mm. to fit in with the rest of society and they feel that any aversion from that to try to, or anxiety that's induced for trying to fit in and to be that so-called normal uh, and ultimately fighting their own monsters, what would you, what would you say to them? Is there anything you would say to them to help them either defeat the mm. monsters or be mm. okay with them or ultimately just sort of be who they're supposed to be yeah. because of their monsters? Yeah, yeah. Well, look, it's, it, again, it's the Clive Barker thing. Sometimes the, the, the monst our monsters are our most beautiful asset. Um, coming to realize that is very, very, very difficult and often very confronting. Um, my advice to anyone going through that stuff is don't give up and to always ask for help and this these type of revelations make you feel incredibly alone um and whilst no one who is feeling that alone ever believes this but you are not alone um and and being able to connect with others and to not be alone is easier now than it ever has been Although don't read the fallen boys because there could be like <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, <laughs> oh yes um, which kind of taps into that, which is, which is a thing with my work because they all interconnect. So whilst that might sound hopeful in regards to Dirty Heads, it does feed into the Fallen Boys because all of these stories do interconnect in very, very subtle ways and not everyone's picked up on. Um, but uh, yeah, don't give up. 
the I think the message it really needs to be those who are supporting people who go through this type of stuff, which is that when you realize that you're something, uh, that person's whole world changes. Like the world jolts out from under your under your feet, and the readjustment that is required. Uh, requires everything that that person may have been expecting of themselves and what other people have been expecting of them to be readjusted mm -hmm. and to be rebuilt. And uh, for me, I can only speak about my experience, but that man, okay, rethinking my thoughts around, uh, around children, marriage, schooling, work, you know, work, um, uh, relationships, sex, sexuality, uh, news, clothes, everything everything had to change and i got there but not everyone does and that's why for example uh lgbti plus kids kill themselves it's why they kill themselves it's because the the earth doesn't just shift it can crack and you fall and so i think that the message is to those who love those who are struggling um, and it's about, it loops it back exactly into what we were talking about early in our conversations in regards to the people that we both work with, yeah. which is that be there, empathize and connect and allow that person to emerge from that on their own. Because the more you try to yank them out of it, the more they will fall. Um, and, and it's inelegant and it's okay to make mistakes. It's okay to make mistakes when you care for someone. Yeah. It's, it, it is a crime to think that caring must be perfection because <laughs> that is a trap. That is a trap. Yeah, um, so I guess that's, I guess that's what I'm saying. Great. No, I really appreciate you saying that. Uh, and you're absolutely right. I, I can definitely relate on so many levels. Um, <clears throat> certainly with my, with my teen as well, um, who is on, on the spectrum and, yeah. you know, certainly in the initial stages of not knowing what the heck to do to help out, there was a lot of mistakes that were made, but like you said, to tie into your other theme of the hope too, you just got to be hopeful that, you know, it's in a, in a sense, I guess it's not really a mistake if you learn from it. And unfortunately, that's part of the process of learning and, and making those mistakes and, and making a little bit messy. So, you know, it doesn't work. So you can, you know, clear that off the plate and then you're left with hopefully a few things that maybe will work or that will connect with that person. And then you, yeah, there, there, there you go. That, that's, I guess that's the lesson. <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah. And, you know, for people who are going through it is that if, for people who are trying, they, they're not going to get it right <laughs> the first time. None of us do. Yeah. Um, and, and that's in terms of the way that I help people in, in my professional life and in my, in my personal life. Uh, it, you just, it's just inelegant by design. And if it wasn't, it's probably not the care you need. <laughs> that, right. would be a, that would be a pill. And that's not what we're doing. That's not what we are. Right. No, I really appreciate you saying that. Um, and, I, and I guess to, to wrap things up, I feel like I could talk to you for, for all day here, uh, or I guess in this case, all night for you. <laughs> but I, I, won't, I won't, though. Um, the other question I have just to wrap things up then, Aaron, is you did touch on uh, you have a short story collection that's uh, going to be coming out uh, uh, next year, I guess, of course, because there's not much of uh, this this one left. Yeah. And where is what is it that we can expect to see of yours all together? Because I know you've got a couple of um, you're in a sort of weird spot, I know, with some of your other books that are had a publisher, then tragedy yeah. occurred. You don't have a publisher. Try and get things back out. Um, what can we expect to maybe be able to hunt down from you over the next year? And where's the best place that people can find more of you and sort of a uh, keep tabs on this uh, amazing uh, journey that you're going on with, uh, with the books. Yeah. Well, look, yeah. So my, all my back catalog is now back in print, thankfully, which is really, really awesome. terrific. I didn't, I, I, I took my time with doing it because I didn't want to just kind of flood and inundate, right. you know, everything, everything. I didn't want to yeah. become that obnoxious author who has <laughs> a, a release all the time because I'm setting readers up for expectations that I cannot live up to from the moment that it's all released. I've got the short story collection coming out. I think it's in April or May of next year. Um, and, and I'm really excited about that. I have been working on the nursing home book for about yeah. nine years, <laughs> nine years. And um, I thought that I had it in a, in a place where I was happy with it. 
I had sold it with a publisher, but that is, I, I withdrew it from that publisher. Um, and I have realized now that uh, it's not ready. It's not ready at all. And um, I am completely rewriting it. I, I am, it has gone from being, and I kid you not, a potential trilogy of books <laughs> down to one big book that I'm now whittled down to a, a nice size book that I'm wow. completely rewriting from third person narrative to first person. So, um, and because it, that story needs that immediacy, I've also realized that I was masking all of the things that I really loved about that book in subterfuge plot strands that appeals to the Twin Peaks nerd in me, <laughs> but which has no relevance to the core of that book other than to put nice curtains on, 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 you know, on, in a room that really, you know, needs the light. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really seriously reworking that thing right now. I've got a little novella in a, in like a, like a little trio release that's going to be coming out from Chris, Camp Crystal Lake uh, at some point next year as well. And I have started work on another book. Uh, which I can't go into yet because <laughs> I'll probably jinx myself. Um, but just suffice to say, it's kind of back in um, back in the Fallen Boys territory in terms of its uh, tone. Uh, whilst it won't be as extreme as that, but it is absolutely that type of of a book. So uh, that's what's going on in terms of the the literary stuff. On on the other side. Film stuff for me has massively started to ramp up. Oh, um, yeah, really, really, really happy. Um, uh, House of Size has been optioned. Um, I've been working with producers on the script. Uh, that has been a director has been signed. These things oh, aren't real sign. until yeah, they're not real until they're real, and it's not real right. until I'm in the cinema and I can see it. But um, that's really, really exciting. COVID definitely plays havoc with that a little bit. Definitely. So. There's House of Size that's kind of happening uh, here in Australia. The short story collection that's coming out next year has already been optioned. And, um, and I'm working with another producer in turning it into an anthology series. I was going to um, ask you if that was the, the direction. That's, that's the plan. Taking a couple of my short stories, but um, working with other writers from around Australia to see how that theme of caring uh, and and the cost of caring uh, is interpreted in different little subcultures around the country. So uh, that's what we're working on as well. Next week, uh, we've got a, a short film that's kind of like the first part of all that that's been doing terrific stuff. It's okay. been winning awards all over the world. We're really, really happy with it. We're flying to Melbourne on Friday of this week and we'll be going down there doing all those the margarita lunches or margarita <laughs> meetings, whatever it is that produces it. I'm like, I'll just, I'm the ideas guy. I'll go, I'll do whatever. So we, yeah. I've been working on a lot of film stuff as well on the side. Um, and yeah, like yourself, just started up a podcast. It's called Let the Cat In with two other Australian authors and oh, cool. got about eight or so episodes out at the moment. So I'm, I'm Congratulations, definitely- that's great. You're a busy thanks, man. man. <laughs> it's, 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 it's a lot, but it's, um, it's, it's my passion. It's not just my self care. It's also my passion. It just might have a different flavor if it wasn't full of all the toxins. So um, it, I would be writing one way or the other. It's 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 part of my identity, yeah. and um and and I'm happy and I'm 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 really you know a good creative little spot at the moment. So whatever's coming, don't hold me to it, but we'll see what pops up first <laughs> and who knows who knows there might be other little surprise releases along the way the, the great thing about dirty heads is that um i it's it's something that i worked with um adam caesar to put out through his little yeah. black t-shirt line which is just a really little small thing but he was like no nope, drop it surprise you've got nothing to lose and everything to gain by just dropping day and date boom surprise release and I'm like, yeah. well, that worked out really well. And the reception has been overwhelming. I'm so Good. happy um, that I might see if I can do something like that in the next year or the year or two. So we'll see what happens. Perfect. Happy no, that's touch. awesome. And like you said, it yeah. was a nice surprise because it's like, oh, I didn't even hear anything about this. All of a sudden, boom, here's a release. Uh, I, yeah, I, I was that. 
I was sitting on it uh, like a little quiet little little oh. munchkin waiting for my time to 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 strike um and <laughs> And yeah, so that devious, that was devious. very, very <laughs> devious. I had a couple of cr crucial partners at play who helped me um, set things up and then, yeah, boom. And we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. But um, yeah, people can find me through, uh, to be honest, Twitter is the best way to, to keep in contact with me uh, yeah. at Aaron Drives. I'm now, I now have a TikTok. Um, <laughs> I think I, I do too, I, but don't ask me how look, to use it. <laughs> I, I I have a TikTok. Let's put it that way, yeah. um, and and we'll leave it at that. that and, and of course, people can contact me through my website, AaronDries.com. But um, I'm always happy to chat to people, um, and if and if people have, I'm also happy to talk to people about the questions and the ambiguity that they have around dirty heads because I'm having a lot of those conversations, which is great. It's, which is great. My 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 fear with a release like that is that people go. Hmm, I have questions and I'm just going to close it and never think about it again. But people seem to be struggling to shake it off. So good. Shake, shake it off with me. I'm happy to let's talk. Perfect. And I think that's the beautiful part about that as well as it really does open up kind of the table for, for being able to sit down and have those conversations, whether you're, you get it, you're not sure. Yeah. Maybe it makes you a little bit angry in some ways. I think it, I think it should, I think it will. Yeah. Uh, whether you're very happy about it, whether you're like, what the heck just happened? It's, it's a great, uh, it's, it's a really good conversation piece. I, uh, I can't wait to share this with my, uh, my crew at work. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So yes. Look, looking forward to that. So. Your crew is now my crew. I, I'm <laughs> high five to them all. Exactly. I know we need to, I don't know, uh, dry squad or none of those sounds. <laughs> because we'll have to come up with something. Look, uh, look, I, I just want you to do dry squad, but it's just like the, the, the cover of Vice Squad. You're just changing the first word. So that, that's, I'm happy with this. Exactly. Because I, I, yeah, I guess it's probably better off to play with maybe your last name. I mean, I don't know, air, air, Airheads or I, I, I don't know. That works. So good. Yeah. That works. <laughs> People with good pace. There we go. I don't know. We'll come up with something. So I'm, Aaron, I'm happy. <laughs> thank you. And I'm happy too. I'm, I'm so, I've been really looking forward to chatting with you. Um, really excited to hopefully we could do this again sometime too. Absolutely. I mean, I think I could probably talk for at least another hour or so about your movie stuff too. So I appreciate yeah. you mentioning that because again, only so much time of the day, especially when you're, you're on the other side of the world and uh, you know, I, I can smell the midnight oil from over here. So thank you. I have me on again i'd be only too happy to, to to keep chatting with you i could do it for hours perfect me as well thank you very much aaron and uh i wish you a good night and uh, and thanks again man it's a uh, beautiful person fantastic writer and i hope that people have tuned in and uh are going out and hunting down your stuff it's, it's worth it hey everybody thanks so much for tuning into this episode of dark bites your destination for uncovering the greatest voices working in dark culture entertainment today if you haven't already feel free to subscribe and turn on the notifications so you don't miss what's coming next and most importantly please do give the like button some skin because it not only declares your mutual love for this dark thing of ours but it also tells you YouTube algorithm powers that be to spread the word about this channel's content which ultimately helps us all out Thanks for visiting Dark Bites. I appreciate you. I wouldn't be here without you, and I do hope you'll come back again. Until then, fellow horror lovers, stay hungry. Stay dark. Oh.